Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all at this session of the Power of Museums, being organized jointly by BITM Kolkata and ICOM India as part of the International Museum Day celebrations. As you know, every year on 18th May, International Museum Day is celebrated to raise awareness about the fact that museums are an important means of exchange, enrichment of cultures, and development of mutual understanding and cooperation among people. This year, the theme for International Museum Day is the power of museums. The power of museums towards achievement of sustainability, the power of innovating on digitization and accessibility, and the power of museums towards community building through education. Today, in this hybrid session, we have a panel of five esteemed speakers who will talk on the theme of this year. I welcome them to this hybrid session. I also welcome our audience who are viewing our program in the YouTube channel and also present physically at BITM. I welcome the students of Museology of Calcutta University who are present here and our colleagues from National Science Museum, Thailand. So let us now start today's proceedings. Our first speaker today is the former director of Nehru Science Center, Mumbai. He was also a former director of NGMA Mumbai, NGMA Bangalore, BITM Bangalore, and National Science Center, Delhi. He has the distinction of curating several national and international exhibitions on diverse subjects varying from science, culture, cricket, history of science and technology in India, life of scientists, etc. He was nominated for the prestigious Eastern Eye Arts, Culture and Theatre Awards in 2018 for the curation of the Cricket Connects India and England exhibition, which was presented at the historic Lord Stadium in London and also displayed at the Nehru Centre London and at Birmingham and Edinburgh. He holds the distinction of being nominated as the nodal officer appointed by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India for the Illuminating India, 5,000 years of science and innovation exhibition at the London Science Museum. He was involved in the establishment of three new science centers and four science and activity centers. He was instrumental in the research and creation of several science center exhibitions and galleries, including the highly acclaimed Our Science and Technology Heritage Gallery at the National Science Center, Delhi. He is also a prolific writer and has published more than 60 popular science articles and research papers in leading science communication journals. Our first speaker today is none other than Sri Shiva Prashad Kenneth. Sir, please start. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Rajiv. And I am a part of uh, the National Council of Science Museum until the, just a year ago. I retired uh, one year back. So that introduction would have been more than sufficient to be one of you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I'm just sharing my screen. I hope you can see the screen. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, no, it's not coming. It's not coming. Uh, not yet visible, sir. Are it's. Does not come, sir. Oh my God! I showing it is. Uh, uh, I thought it's again showing. Let's see. Can you see it now? It's yeah, coming. It's, it's coming. Yes. Yes. Sir. Okay. Um, at the outset, uh, wishing you all a very happy International Museums Day. My esteemed uh, colleague speakers, uh, uh, from uh, not only from India, from abroad also, we have Dr. Ganigar Chen, Vice President of the National Science Museum, Thailand. Uh, my dear friend, uh, with whom I had the honor to work in Delhi, uh, Dr. Supriya Chandra. Um, of course, Rajiv Nathji, uh, Professor Ambika Patel, I mean, the uh, President of the ICOM uh, India, and also um, Sri uh, Tarun Thakralji, uh, the 
founder and managing trustee of the Heritage Transport uh, Museum. Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity. I've been working uh, with the Science Museum for all these years. So I'll be speaking on the power of museums, uh, basically for connecting people with science in India, what the genesis is all about, and the power of community um, building through education. Uh, you know, I think Rajiv Ji, Rajiv Nath uh, briefly talked about uh, the significance of the International Museums Day. Um, museums have the power to transform the world around us as uh, incomparable places of discovery. They teach us about our past and our, open our minds to new ideas. Um, stop uh, two essential steps in building a better future. Um, to give you the best example of how science museums have been able to connect to the people, um, I, you know, is the two recent exhibition. One was an outbreak. Uh, this was, uh, we talked about uh, an outbreak exhibition. Uh, outbreak happened in, uh, all of us know that 1908, uh, it was called as the Spanish flu. And subsequently, you know, 100 years later, in 2018, um, we organized this exhibition at the, the Nehru Science Center. Irony is we never imagined that um, the pandemic, COVID pandemic is going to strike us in just about a year or so. We also organized another exhibition known as Superbugs. The reason why I'm putting these two things is if you really see the vaccine hesitancy across the developing nation, it could be European countries, it could be uh, US and several other countries, there is so much of a vaccine hesitancy. But in India, uh, with uh, maybe about 25% of the people still to be educated and lot many people who do not have the scientific, so-called scientific awareness, yet um, we as a nation, we are able to almost vaccinate all our population who were eligible for the vaccination. So that's the power of the, the museums to connect to the people. Of course, I'm not telling that it's only the museums. We have, been, we have also played our small little incremental role in creating this awareness. Uh, this is another, I think this uh, photograph was taken just yesterday or day before yesterday at the, the Nehru Science Center. Mm, as a part of the International Museums Day celebration, uh, Mr. Umesh Kumar had organized uh, what is called as a heritage talk. You can see the diversity of the group, the community who are participating in this. One was heritage walk across the, what we call as a antiquity objects or uh, historic um, uh, automobiles. And the other side, on the right side, you know, uh, you can see the ladies, you know, the diverse uh, type of people, community who comes to the science center to be benefited from this. It, science is no longer, uh, our science museums are no longer restricted only to the school students. The community as a whole, right from the grandson to the father to the, the grandfather, maybe four uh, a generation of people come here, share um, uh, the, what is the, the beauty of science. Now, talking about the power of museums, uh, since time is very short, I'll run through. Um, you know, it can also help us in reinterpreting the historical misplaced understanding. I mean, the Rajiv, Rajiv Nath also talked about illuminating India exhibition. Uh, I'm going to highlight this exhibition. When we were ruled by the, the colonial rulers, Britishers in particular, while uh, introducing the what Mr. Macaulay called as the modern education system, uh, you know, what he said, this is something very important. Um, he says, a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. This is the minute recorded in 1935. So even during the, just about um, less than 100 years ago, this was the information, the understanding of uh, what India was. You know, India is, we all now know, I mean, at least the Europeans also know that uh, India has a rich history of which dates back to more than 5,000 years. In less than 100 years uh, from the understanding of India as a nation whose uh, the, the knowledge can be confined to one um, European, I mean, a good European library, uh, a single person, single shelf. You know, you can see what has happened now. 100 years later, just in 2018, less than 100 years later, uh, 2017 happened to be the 70 years of the Indian independence. As a part of the, what is called as a cultural exchange program between India and England, but there were several events organized. Uh, one was, of course, the Cricket Connects exhibition. The other one was this profound exhibition called as the Fight, uh, Illuminating India, 5,000 Years of Science and Innovation. Uh, the, this was organized uh, at the London Science Museum. Imagine in London Science Museum, the London Science Museum people 
are talking about 5000 years of science and innovation in india this is the power of the museum to uh, redeeming the glory that we we should have really got even when the britishers were ruling uh, there were several objects which went from india um, for this uh, exhibition primarily of course the london science museum relied on the objects that they have in their collection um ex i mean coincidentally because of this exhibition uh, in the oxford collection they have what is called as a bakshali manuscript when i when i was part of the curation of this uh, of an exhibition on heritage uh, way back in 92 we had done this and we thought that the bakshali manuscript uh, dates back to about uh, anywhere between about 7th century or so even uh, in the delhi science center in 2009 when this exhibition was curated we again dated this to thir um, 9th century but fortunately the oxford decided to carbon date this manuscript to understand what exactly is the period when uh, to which this belongs and lo behold lo and behold you know this uh, the dating for this uh, bakshali manuscript was between 2nd and 4th century ad so i have taken the median and called it as a 3rd century ad that means we as indians knew the the decimal place value including the use of va the value the symbol zero and value zero sometime somewhere in 3rd century ad and if you contextualize this and look at what the europeans were particularly the italians um they were not able to utilize use the i mean the um decimal place value system the whole of the merchants had to put pressure on the government to allow them to use this that is the reason even today if you really look at the gateway of india um, or india gate you will find the the year of the construction put in roman numbers primarily because um, they were uh, the the merchants were asked were permitted to use the um, indian decimal place value system with a rule that wherever there is an official record you got to use the roman numbers so that is a history and then this museum has the capacity to redeem the lost glory and connect the communities together as that we are one single community cutting across the religion language caste and creed barrier countries etc that is the power of the museums so i am not going to cover this indian contribution of uh, science and technology which was lost in communication by the british because all of us know um i will also now talk to you that how actually the science museum started in india and globally uh it all started with the necessity or the urge for the people um for basically the people who are producing this wonderful gadgets post the industrial revolution there were not many things that were being uh, manufactured um so this they were all put in an exhibition called the famous crystal palace exhibition in 1851 post the exhibition uh, they thought that where do how do we because this exhibition helped in connecting the people with the products later on it was decided that once the exhibition is over all these uh, wonderful pieces of art uh, should be stored in uh, some kind of a museum and that is how the kensington museums a series of three museums in um, london they came up um, there was another uh, interesting thing happening for connecting science with community and that was um, at the royal uh, society you know humphrey davy is one of the man um, one of the scientists who used to deliver some stunning lectures to the uh, the people one of the attendee for the humphrey davy's lecture was michael faraday who was kind of an half educated he was not even formally educated he was just a book binder and it so happened that um, he was fortunate enough to get a free pass um, with that free pass he went and attended the, one of humphrey davy's lecture and the rest is history he went on to become one of the greatest sub scientists became the royal uh, so, uh, fellow of the royal society and even today there are lectures which he um, very famously delivered at uh, the royal society which are called as faraday lectures so that is the power of the the this the p connecting to the community and then that community can transform the, the the it could be museums or it could be any institutions knowledge institutions which can transform society and standing example is michael faraday listening to um, one of the speaker now this is the the crystal palace exhibition of 1851 uh, it was organized um, in london from 1st may to 11th october you can see on the right side uh, you have this india pavilion a massive pavilion with full of wealth um, but unfortunately it was called as more of a craft rather than art um, that is the reason you know the the wealth of art that we have which is uh, resplendent in all across the country in uh, the art architecture 
temple monuments, all kinds of uh, architecture, which we can say across the country that there was a creativity all across. So it is but natural that India was kind of a living museum um, cutting from Srinagar to uh, right below um, in Kanyakumari. Uh, what happened is I told you about uh, once the, the, Kensing, uh, the Crystal Palace uh, exhibition was over, all these things were uh, put in a museum and this museum was called as Museum of Manufactories. You know, because basically the products were coming from the factories, they called it as a Museum of Manufactories, which was subsequently later on um, changed to uh, the three museum. This is one interesting uh, um, observation of a visitor. You can read this. There is, of course, some grammatical mistakes in that, but this is exactly quoted. Amazed, I pass from glass to glass. Delighted, I survey them. Fresh wonders grows before me knows in this sublime museum. This was one of the gentlemen by name W. M. Thackeray. This is he's quoting the account of one of the visitors, Mr. Maloney, of the Crystal Palace. Such is the power of the exhibitions, and uh, museums are known for exhibiting of uh, their collection curating them in a, in a right perspective. So from the Crystal Palace collection, these three museums came up. One is the Victorian, Victoria and Albert Museum, the Natural History Museum, and London Science Museum. So particularly the London Science Museum has been inspirational for uh, starting of the, uh, the museums in India. And the Crystal Palace exhibition, in a way, is also responsible for uh, the, the commencement of museum movement in uh, India. Similarly, after the Crystal Palace exhibition, there was another exhibition, international exhibition, industrial exhibition at Paris in 1889. Uh, the Eiffel Tower that you see here was basically a gate to this massive exhibition, which has now become an icon for the city of Paris. I'm using this exhibition primarily because this uh, exhibition was seen by one of the founders of the Dorsch's Museum. Dorsch's Museum connects very well to India, so that's why I've used this. Uh, in 1883, around to 1884, 4th December 1883 to 10th March 1884, we had a massive Calcutta International Exhibition. It was organized very close to the, you know, in the, the Indian Museum was also one of the part of this. And this was a massive exhibition. And in this just about uh, four months or so, it was visited by 1 million visitors. Incidentally, this exhibition was not su supported by the government. In spite of that, uh, um, it had about a million visitors. That is the power of the exhibitions to connect to the people. And um, in a way, museums are uh, repositories of all these wonderful objects which were uh, showcased in, all, in the, such exhibitions. This is another view of the um, 1883 International Exhibition in Calcutta. This is an outside view. We talk about the science parks in uh, science museum. You can see the outside, uh, um, uh, there are all these uh, uh, generators and windmills and such other things which were displayed outside in 1884 at the Calcutta Museum exhibition. It, I suppose that uh, um, this must have been inspirational for starting of a, of the hydroelectric power in, uh, in, in Mumbai, uh, very close to Mumbai. Um, there's a place called Kapoli, the 40 megawatt uh, hydroelectric power was started. I think this maybe they could have gone and seen this to see the, uh, the generators and take this to benefit people. I talked to you about the Dorsch's Museum. Uh, Dorsch's Museum was started in 1903 and 1920. It became one of the, the biggest attraction in Europe. And as it, um, it was attracted by millions of visitors. So they also had this uh, wonderful demonstration. The founding fathers of Indian museums, science museums, actually visited this uh, Dorsch's Museum. That is the reason I've highlighted this. Similar to what we had the, the, the Royal Society lectures, in India, too, during what is called as the Renaissance time, Indian scientific Renaissance time, Indian Association for Cultivation of Science played the role of the Royal Society in India. So I will not go into these things because of the lack of time. These are the people who were actually delivering lectures from the Indian Association of Cultivation of Science to the people, connecting science to the people. Now, let me come straight to the history of the um, science museums in India. Of course, the Indian Museum started uh, much before the Crystal Palace exhibition in 1814. But then most of the museums in India, you will, you will, uh, you will realize that they were also uh, displaying the natural history products and uh, or geology and such other things which have a connection with science. Unfortunately, what has happened is um, uh, maybe about 70 years and 
post the independence or uh, even today uh, both science and art museums are working as uh, as separate islands there is not much of an interaction between the two or science and art museums, art archaeology museums. I think this is an occasion on uh, International Museum Day and when you know all of us have assembled here that both art and science, which are creative in nature, museum is ex museum exemplifies this creativity, we should work together. Uh, the Victorian and Albert Museum of the Decorative Art and Industrial Arts exhibition came up in Bombay in 1855. But actually, it was open to the public in 1872. In fact, this museum is celebrating 150 years um, uh, this year. There's another exhibition, it's now called as the Jaipur Museum, but uh, it was an outcome of an industrial arts museum, um, arts exhibition, which happened in 1881. Then there's another Lord Ray Museum in Pune that also was because of the uh, exhibition that happened in Pune. Then we have the Prince of Wales Museum. Um, I'm actually working here now. Um, that came up in 1922. Subsequent to this, then comes the, the museum movement. I'm not highlighting about other museums. Kindly excuse me for that, since uh, I'm going to be speaking on science museum. I will talk about uh, the NPL uh, muse science museum in, in the NPL campus, then the Birla Museum, um, Pilani, BITM, of course, our mother museum, Vishweshwaraya Museum, Nehru Science Center Mumbai, and uh, the NCSM. Of course, I talked to you about Indian Museum. I will not highlight on that. Uh, uh, Similarly, the, the two other museums, one is the uh, uh, Mahavdaji Lard Museum in uh, Bombay and uh, the other one is Mahatma Phule Museum. Now let's come to this one, the Bits Museum Pilani. Uh, again, the Birlas have actually visited uh, uh, the London Science Museum and they wanted to have the similar kind of a thing. That is how this museum started in 1954. Uh, so this, you can say, is the first uh, science museum in India. I will not, uh, because there is no time, I will not speak much about Pilani Museum. Uh, I have used this Dhanraj Bhagat because uh, Pilani Museum, in a way, uh, was helpful in developing uh, wonderful artists who were able to, who could make dioramas. Because uh, Pilani Museum people had purchased ready-made dioramas from London and brought it to Pilani. Unfortunately, during the shipment, the dioramas were broken. When they asked them to repair, they charged them a bomb. That was the time uh, when the Birlas approached uh, the School of Architecture, that time it was not known as School of Arch Architecture in Delhi. And this gentleman, Dhanraj Bhagat, was the director of that. So he assigned this to VP Berry, and the rest is history. VP Berry turned out to be one of the best managers who produced some of the best uh, diorama makers in India. Then we had this National Physical Laboratories where a science center came up. It was the time when we had K.S. Krishnan there as a director. Uh, K.S. Krishnan identified one Mr. Subramanyam to head this museum. Um, I'm not going to go into the details. So there was a small little planetarium which started there in the science center. It became so very popular that uh, lots of people started coming to this uh, place. The scientists were up in arms against Krishnan and told that, no, I, we are getting disturbed. Let this museum be closed. That's how the museum got closed. But uh, the spin-off benefit was that Subramanyam traveled all the way from Delhi to Calcutta and uh, Birla Planetarium that you see there was his creation, which is still existing in the in Calcutta. Now come we come to a mother museum, Birla Museum, where BITM, you're all sitting there, some of you physically. This is our mother museum. Um, this was courtesy Dr. B.C. Roy, whom I consider as the, the kind of a father figure for uh, the science museum uh, movement in India. He had visited Dorsh's museum, and then he came back and called up uh, Pandit Nehru and said, we should start a similar museum in India. And Pandit Nehru told, spoke to G.D. Birla and the land where you are, it was actually donated by G.D. Birla, including the magnificent, uh, architecturally beautiful uh, building where BI team um, is situated. So this was opened on 2nd May 1959. Uh, due to sh uh, lack, uh, shortage of time, I will not cover much. But um, I'm just giving you some of the a glimpse of uh, the opening of the Birla Museum and how actually it connected uh, uh, to the people, to the community across uh, uh, caste, religion, caste. Um, and it was BHM which also conceived what is known as a mobile museum. These are some of the collections. Then subsequently in 1962, um, that was the time when um, um, Bharat Ratna Vishwa died on 14th April. So it was decided to commemorate his uh, uh, 
memories, a museum should be started. That is how we started Vishweshwara Industrial Technological Museum. You will notice that both Birla Industrial Technological Museum and Vishweshwara Industrial Technological Museum continue to retain their names of museum and they had wonderful collections. Subsequently, after this, what happened is uh, the next one was, uh, uh, no, I'm talk this is the mobile science van I was talking uh, about. Uh, this was started by BITM in 1965-66. Uh, we were the first people to start this. Okay, okay now and let me come to Science Center. Uh, uh, Nehru Science Center actually initially it was planned as a Mafatlal Industrial and Technological Museum. Um, we were still under part of the CSIR, but uh, CSIR was taking a lot of time the, and uh, Mafatlal uh, had actually given a plot of land and also had given about 70 lakh rupees for starting a museum. But since time elapsed and nothing happened, in the meantime, the founding fathers of the Science Museum visited uh, what is known as an exploratorium. And suddenly the concept changed from uh, museum to hands-on type of activity. And that's how uh, the Nehru Science Center came up. Post uh, the opening of the Nehru Science Center 1979 or 1985, all these science centers which have come up under the National Council of Science Museum, unfortunately do not have the name of a museum. I personally feel uh, it could have been a science center and a museum, but then I mean, uh, it's all history now. But although we are called as a science center, we continue to function with the same objectives that the museums uh, conduct themselves. And today on this occasion of the, the National um, and the International Museum Day, I feel we are as much a part of uh, the museum community as anybody else across the, uh, the world. Um, this just a glimpse of this because time is very short. I'm giving you some of the collections at the, the Nehru Science Center. You can see the left side here, it is a restored uh, electric locomotive. On the right side, you can see how this electric locomotive was uh, actually trans transported from Sion. Uh, in fact, this is the first engine which uh, was actually driving the Deccan Queen Express and it was taking just about two hours, 45 minutes. Even today, um, in 2022, um, Bombay to Pune, the journey is about, by the Deccan Queen is about three hours, 15 minutes. That means this train, what you see, which is in our collection, um, uh, was traveling much faster and that, that too in the year 1925 to uh, uh, post 1925. So I think uh, uh, time is very short. Uh, Rajiv, should I, my, do I have some more time? Or should I end? Hello. Sir, you, hello. Huh. Sir, I hmm. think you can take another uh, three, four minutes. Three, four minutes. Okay. This is another collection that uh, we have. Um, the reason I'm showing showing the collections is, um, although we are called the Nehru Science Center, we have some of the stunning collection. This is a, a, um, it's called as a steam lorry, or um, it's also called as a steam wagon. Uh, it's the four ton um, um, lorry which was run by uh, steam engine you can see the uh, for the exhaust for the steam there i mean uh, the uh, smoke uh, which you can see there it was a four ton um, lorry uh, which was collected from the mazgaon top we had collected two such things one was a four ton um, lorry and the other one was a six ton one this date packs to between uh, 1906 to 1916. incidentally with, during our research i thought that it should be somewhere between around 1906 but there is one enthusiast in London. He read my blog and said that, no, he gave me the exact uh, time when this was purchased from a company called Sentinel. And according to him, it dates to somewhere around 1909 or 1910. This is the power of the museum to cut uh, when, uh, across the um, um, time and space. Then we had this uh, one of the beautiful Marut aircraft. We are talking about the light combat aircraft now um, in 1960, 63, 64. We were the India was the first country to actually manufacture, design, develop, and manufacture uh, the fighter aircraft. Unfortunately, it did not uh, succeed because of some bureaucratic hurdles. Uh, the designer wanted to buy a, a particular engine. He was not allowed. So the aim that he had to uh, make this uh, Maruti 24 fly at uh, two max, um, he could not succeed, and it ended up um, gaining about 0.9 max. Notwithstanding its failure, but it did play a crucial role in the 1971 uh, Bangladesh Liberation War and particularly in the Longewala uh, region. I'm sure uh, those of you who have seen the border film will realize the importance of this. I think I will stop here. These are uh, another, uh, I'll just rush through some of the images and uh, stop here. This is again the first concept of an outdoor park which we had. 
and this is now from the, from BHM in 1959, from where we started as a museum. Uh, now National Council of Science Museum has uh, uh, grown very rapidly. We have about 23 science centers besides, of course, the headquarters and other things. And we have developed uh, another about 40 odd science centers and handed it over to uh, the state governments. In all, if you consider science centers as a museum, we are collectively are about 70 to 80 such uh, uh, science museums across the country. And it's time that we should connect with uh, the fellow museums, both in art, archaeology, um, so that we collectively can um, make a difference to the community and show what the power of the museums are. Thank you. And I would like to specifically thank uh, these people who have helped me with getting some of, some of the information. Daulakandi, Mr. Ramachandran, Manas Bakchi, Nehru Science Center, Mumbai, NCSM, Calcutta, Wiki Commons, and London Science Museum. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for that wonderful talk. It's always nice to hear from you. And today also we were enlightened by your talk. Uh, you showed the power of community building of museums across age and cultures and the reinterpretation of the historical misplaced understanding in the Illuminating India exhibition and the 5,000 years of science and innovation exhibition. And then you took us through a ride through the Crystal Palace exhibition, the Humphrey Devi lectures, the Museum of Manufactories, the Calcutta International Exhibition, and then to the science centers and science museums of India. I hope, uh, I think that later on we will have some questions for you from the museology students who are present here but still then sir it's thank you once again from BITM. Our next speaker today is Dr. Ganigar Chen. Dr. Chen is the vice president of National Science Museum Thailand and uh, Dr. Chen has been working with the National Science Museum Thailand since 2000. She started as a science educator an international research advisor, and she has been involved in developing museum education programs, public programs, science media, and science communication training. She has developed the operation strategy for NSM outreach unit called Science Caravan, which in each year reaches out to population in more than 10 provinces around Thailand. As vice president museum operation, she also supervises a number of new exhibition development projects, development of population science, popular science media, science television programs, and science online media. Dr. Ganiga Shen was also an executive committee member of ASPAC and also an editorial advisor of Dimension magazine published by ASTC. Please welcome Dr. Ganiga Shen. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really honored um, to have a chance to join uh, as a panel in this forum to celebrate the International uh, Museum Day. Um, thanks to BITM and ICOM for your kind invitation um, and all the thanks to all the organizing agencies. I'm so excited. This is my first time um, to be able to share and, um, and hear and talk to our um, colleagues in India. And I have to congratulate um, uh, everyone um, uh, for the success in um, promoting um, science museum and science centers in India. It's very impressive. Um, congratulations. I believe that um, sharing idea is an important way to grow um, our work and our mind. So I hope that uh, the presentation today, uh, we will learn from each other. Uh, so let me share my um, slide. Um, okay, just one moment. Um, can you see my screen now? Can you, can you see my, okay? Does it show my presentation? Not yet. No. no. Okay, one moment. Okay. Okay. 
Can you see my presentation now? It's up there in the screen. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, as you know, um, I'm Ganika Chen. I'm the vice president of the National Science Museum. My name, Ganika, represents a kind of flower. Um, they call night flower jasmine, which is white petal with red stem. I understand this is uh, origin in North India. So I don't know if you have any flower of similar um, kind, but I, I feel like I share some um, you know, uh, something in common, um, you know, the Thai language, a lot of things derive from, from Indian language. So I hope that in the future, I would be able to learn more from all of you and as well as Indian language. My presentation today would be um, covering um, the ideas of how museums can be a platform to raise public awareness of sustainability. Uh, and I will show some of the movements in Thailand and Asia Pacific. So the idea is that no matter uh, you are size museum or any kind of museums, and no matter where you are, and how, no matter how big or small your museum is, you know you can be part of the um, organization or be part of the uh, power to raise awareness in sustainability. First of all, just a quick um, introduction of the National Science Museum, Thailand. We are a state enterprise under the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation. Uh, we are much younger than you, uh, but we are not that young. So we were established in 1995 and our target group is, you know, every walk of life. We have um, three, uh, four museums at the moment in Batum Thani province, which is the vicinity of Bangkok. Science Museum, Natural History Museum, Information Technology Museum, and Ramana Ecology Museum. We also have um, um, uh, other venues in um, not in our main complex. So we call them size squares because they are not museum, but more like a um, small size centers. One in the Bangkok, one in Chiang Mai, um, and one in. Uh, Nakhon Ratchasima, which is northeast of Thailand. And now we are planning for one in the south. And also we are building a new museum in our main complex called Fugerium. Um, as you know, we also have a size caravan program, which is similar to your size outreach. And I think this is something um, that uh, makes we want to do to make sure that our mission will be um, covering you know, people all over Thailand. We are also the um, national coordinator of National Science and Te Technology Fair or F Sci Festival. It's usually organized in August and um, it's international event. So maybe next year um, you can join us. Okay. Okay. Now talking about project in sustainability. Our Ramana Ecology Museum um, is a museum that dedicated to um, the agenda of sustainability, we have a concept of connecting human life and nature. So we talk about our home, which is our earth. Uh, we talk about our life is how um, living things were uh, created on different biodiversities, uh, different bio um, condition. And then we have uh, talk about the way we could live in harmony together, uh, which uh, based on the sufficiency theory of our past King Rama Danai. So the museum is um, dedicated to all the activities, not only in Thailand, but in um, Asia Pacific to raise awareness of water, soil, biodiversity. In, um, in every year in, um, during our Sai festival, we organize um, what we call the um, uh, symposium uh, on site festival. And we invite our uh, friends, our museum friends uh, from ASEAN country, as well as um, um, China, Japan, and Korea to join. And we discuss how we could engage um, all the public, you know, through several um, science agenda. But in 19, uh, uh, 2018, we start to talk about um, SDG agendas. And we realized that um, as museums uh, people, 
we should work together um, to develop uh, more activities to communicate and raise awareness on um, sustainability. So at that time, um, you know, from this uh, symposium in 2018, we have identified the key priority areas because there are many SDGs and and of course everything is important. But we have we think that with our limited resource, we should uh, try to focus. So finally, we um, prioritize you know our um, area of SDG um, to promote is quality education, good health and well being clean water and sanitation, industry innovation and infrastructure, and life below water. However, um, as time goes by, we also um, set up um, other um, areas that we would like to focus more. For example, food security, food safety, uh, pollution, climate change, and other inequalities. Well, um, from um, from the platform that we usually meet each other and think uh, among friends internationally, we also try to empower each other, you know, among um, museums' friends on finding uh, proper tools to raise awareness on uh, sustainability. And in 2021, um, last year, we start to discuss about um, one important approach, uh, which is uh, very um, engaging to the public. Uh, we call it citizen science. I believe you might have heard about it or might use it already in uh, some of the museums. But um, with this uh, symposium last year, we uh, we are, we invite a lot of panels um, from different fields, not only in museums, but from NGOs, uh, from medias, you know, and also from public health department uh, to share how they use uh, citizen science to engage the public um, to health and environment. And we learn from each other a lot. So from this symposium, um, we start to have a network, okay? And um, just last month, um, no, two months ago in, in March, we already uh, start uh, one project together in the network, which is called City Nature Challenges. This is a global um, activity to involve the public to um, explore the, in, um, the plant animals in the city that are naturally uh, habited there and um, input this information onto an online platform called iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a platform uh, developed by California Academy of Science. Anyone can take a picture uh, and key in the location of that um, animals or plants, and then uh, their information will be um, in the database. And they can also, from this information, they can identify or find out what plant and animals um, they are. And also this database become a big data that you can analyze and find out later uh, what happens uh, in terms of uh, distribution of plant and animals in the city. This uh, activity has been organized um, countrywide. Uh, in many um, cities in Thailand with uh, partnership uh, with many people. So I think um, this is a good project to, to engage, you know, the citizen, no matter their size or non-size or um, children or um, elderly, they can also involve in this, okay? So this is, um, uh, that's one of the example of how museum can partner to raise awareness in um, sustainability. This is another project uh, that we involve the public in um, in environmental education. Uh, we have a photo uh, contest uh, um, organized through our website uh, um, quarterly. It's called Science is Out There. So the public or, or anyone um, can take a picture uh, based on the theme we, we designate that and they post that photo with short um, caption on what is the size behind it, okay? And uh, through this, we got a lot of um, um, pictures reflecting the public uh, thought about 
you know, health. Uh, the first one is about social distancing, okay? The second one is about biodiversity um, uh, and the um, garbage in the city, okay? So I say um, garbage affecting um, life in the wild. And the third one is um, the picture of people who are working um, at risk on um, garbage collection. So um, I think these um, simple way to engage the public and let them be part of the um, people who help raising awareness to others uh, on the sustainability issues is very um, important and powerful in terms of communicating um, these uh, agendas. Um, similar to the previous uh, photo contest, we extend this to uh, international um, photo contest, but focusing on our priority agenda, which is life below water. So already for four years, we organize international photo exhibition um, uh, relating to water, a uh, river and ocean. Uh, last year, the theme was river and ocean connecting water to life. Um, this year, uh, we have about 300 entries from sorry, from different countries, okay? And we have an award for, uh, uh, for them. We involve National Geographic, we involve IUCN, which is the environmental NGOs, and many others uh, to be the judge. So I think um, this is another uh, example of project that we might be able to work together with uh, Indian um, network as well, okay? This year, the, the, the theme of the photo competition uh, will be on um, connect interconnection folks and living creature because we want to encourage um, uh, fisheries which is um, not harmful to the uh, to the sea and the ocean. Okay, there are other um, examples of how we could repeat the uh, message uh, through our digital media uh, through. Um, simple um, thing like you know how you can take care of your um, brain how you can eat uh, healthily uh, I think this kind of message you know um, it's very simple for the public to digest and also you can use it repeatedly through many kind of social medias okay um, another way to, we, we work in order to engage the, the public is, of course, to organize various activities. Um, this is an example we call Junior Naturalist, where we um, have our researchers, our natural scientists um, coming to talk and share with the young generation, uh, with the kids on um, biodiversity and then let them be part of the um, research of the naturalist. But, but then during that time, we also give them an awareness of how we could um, treat these creatures nicely and we study them and we let them go to the wild so that the students can appreciate nature, but at the same time, know how to preserve nature. Uh, we also try to organize several student projects, simple projects, not very um, um, advanced, but let the students explore um, nature and explain or communicate what they found in nature. Uh, we find that the school like it very much because not many school um, uh, or not many teachers can um, organize this size project that is very advanced uh, with tools and then experiment. But this sort of um, size project uh, allow the students to explore, to observe, and um, to get their own um, reflection on what they find about uh, nature. And this is a very good way to um, make them more um, appreciate nature. Okay, um, other than that, we try to engage, um, let's say youth, okay, to be the creator of um, science content, particularly the global agendas. Um, so we have a program called Short Science Film Award, uh, which we work in partnership with um, uh, Thai Public Broadcasting 
and many famous directors in Thailand. So the students uh, attend the program. They were trained how to make um, short side film. And then uh, they make films and um, the films will communicate to people of that age, okay, uh, uh, the youth um, themselves on how we could, we should be aware or protect the, um, the um, environment or make sure we are, uh, be part of the people who take care of um, sustainability. This is another program. Um, we believe that um, to communicate um, sustainability or even communicate science, we cannot do alone. And NSM is not a very big um, organization. So we try to um, cultivate more science communicators, especially young people, um, to convince and, and, and to, to um, train them to be uh, young science communicators. However, the mostly we will um, focus um, uh, and let them focus on the agenda of the um, sustainability, for example, health, climate change, food. Okay, for example, this year it's about better health. So uh, every year we have about 40 to 50 young science communicators um, training and helping to communicate to, to others. Um, of course, at NSM, uh, every year at our size festival, we will develop a new exhibition um, uh, on food security, on energy, or uh, on other uh, important agendas, uh, global crisis. And then um, this exhibition will later on be used as a traveling exhibition to other size centers in the country. But more importantly, um, in the latest, in the uh, la in last year, uh, our side festival is organized in a way that we try to reduce the um, the, the the trash and um, let's say we we try to make sure that uh, everything is green and no no much um, things is thrown away. So we call this side festival BCG in action. So all the kids, you know, they have to bring their own um, uh, cloth bag. We will reduce the use of uh, plastic bags and even paper bags in the fair. We will reduce uh, all the boxes and everything. So I think it's also important that if we are going to talk about sustainability, museum uh, also have to try very hard, you know, to lead and to show that uh, we could do something, you know, to make sure that uh, we are friendly to the environment. Of course, we cannot do 100% what we do try, okay? Well, um, as you know, I'm um, the executive me uh, member of ASPAC. We uh, have many um, ASPAC projects which um, are focusing on um, youth engagement. And uh, in the recent year, we focus on um, sustainability as well. For example, we have a size drama competition, which is an international one. And the theme would be uh, our sea and our and oceans for the future. Um, this year it was hosted by um, my museum in the Philippines. But what we do is we organize a local uh, size drama first to select uh, the best group and then they can go to attend the international one so i think this kind of um, thing is also power of museum that we work together and um, show to the children and the public that you know everyone can be part of the one the uh, can can help to communicate uh, sustainability well um last thing i would like to talk here is besides you know all the public engagement activity uh, we are working with uh, some of the countries in uh, Southeast Asia and China on developing some curriculum. Well, curriculum is uh, some, uh, th there is some limitation in current curriculum in school. There are environmental, um, uh, there are curriculum in environmental um, education, but it's not very, uh, deep or focusing on certain things, for example, climate change or water. 
So what we are trying to work together is to develop um, more specific curriculum on sustainability too as <clears throat> an optional for schools that they can pick up and, and use you know, to raise awareness um, for the uh, students. So this is another project that I think museum can work with all the partners, you know, and we can help changing the future um, generation. <clears throat> well, in summary, uh, NSM approach to raise um, SDG awareness. First of all, we try to be a platform to work with everyone, you know, um, as both organizers and sometimes as participants. Second, we prefer learning um, together in partnership uh, because we believe that would make wider impact. We try to uh, partnership even to the young people and um, encourage them to be science communicators. Um, third, we try to reach out um, not only one group of uh, youth, but we are thinking of um, you know uh, elderly uh, and um, people who at work, you know, photographers, filmmakers, and etc. We try to use art and science so that it's um it's lighter, it's more simple, and then of course you use simple way and repeating message to um to get people involved. Okay, and last uh, we try to um, provide opportunity for two way communication, get the public reflect on their thought. And um, we can see um, how they think and then work together with them on how we can take care of our earth. Well, uh, I think communicating SDGs uh, museum can help a lot. And however, we have to also think uh, all the time uh, who we're gonna communicate to, uh, what we're gonna do, how we're gonna do it, and then um, by whom, it means who should be all the partners in this project, okay? Um, it's not easy. Sustainability is sometimes very abstract, uh, sometimes very concrete. So uh, it's still uh, some challenge for all of us. But I believe that uh, as museums, you know, we all um, central. I mean, we are, we are, we don't have other agenda except um, the well-being of the public. So um, power of partnership, power of thinking together, power to inspire um, young generation and to inspire each other, uh, other museums, other organization. I think we can make a change in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. It was wonderful hearing from you and the journey and the journey you took us through the NSM and its different activities the NSM Science Squares, the Science Caravan Program, the National Science and Technology Fair, the Rama Ecology Museum, and of course, uh, how NSM Thailand is trying to, uh, through its different programs and activities, to attend the sustainability development goals of UN. And um, you also showed us how NSM Thailand is being involved in different science, citizen science projects. And uh, yes, uh, the international photo exhibition on rivers and oceans and the short science films. In fact, we also have similar kind of activities in our museums, science museums in India. Maybe in the coming days, we can have a synergy of the activities you have there and in, in our place, and we can come up with something better. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Thank you once again. Thank you. Our third speaker for today is Professor Ambika Patel. She is currently the president of ICOM India and uh, head of the Department of Museology in the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda. Before being the president of ICOM India, she was the secretary of ICOM India. She is also a board member of ICOM XPEC. And Professor Patel has received a number of international fellowships, which includes the Andrew Mellon Conservation Fellowship, the UK Visiting Fellowship, and Indo-French Exchange Fellowship. She has coordinated a number of national level seminars 
and undertaken research projects as a principal project investigator and a PhD supervisor for archaeology and museum studies. Please welcome our third speaker today, Professor Ambika Bipin Patel. Professor Patel. Namaskar. Thank you, Mr. Ambika. Uh, Rajiv Naji and uh, a warm good evening to all of you, uh, Shiv Prasad sir, uh, Ms. Chen and Thakral ji. Uh, it's my privilege to be one among you as the panelist to speak uh, on the platform of uh, you know, National Science uh, Museums uh, and uh, VITM. So, uh, First of all, let me take this opportunity to wish all of you a wonderful International Museum Day. We all are the one family. I was just remembering what Shiva Prasad sir right now said. Uh, I will be taking you to a journey from Science Museum to Art Museum because I'm a person. I studied, I did my graduation with Science, Physics, Chemistry, Maths, but moved on to Humanities because of my passion to study Archaeology. And then from there, I moved into uh, museum studies because, uh, you know, that was again the collaborative and connecting field. And in between, I did tourism management. So I tried to connect, you know, science with humanities, with fine arts, and then moving into tourism management, a mixed blend of science with marketing, science with fine arts, science with arts. So my presentation will be a bit on social science dimensions, but definitely I will be trying to touch something on the SDGs and the science dimension where we could have more collaborations and things like that without uh, leaving the focus of the power of the museum. So let me take my uh, take your permission to share my screen. in a remote place traveling uh, and then in between I am uh, having a hall to do this event since morning uh, so bear me uh, if if at all some network issues comes in between I hope it should not happen in between uh, is the screen visible yes, okay please. okay thank you so we all are uh, here today gathering to talk on the you know the power of the museum through the IMD 2022 uh, we all know as museum professional, whether we are in science museum or in art museum or in, uh, you know, tribal museum or whatever kind of museum we are into, we are all having collection. We are all dealing with uh, communicating with the society. We are all trying to do our sector, the museum sector, a powerful engine to communicate with society, to benefit the society. So uh, not taking much of time, the few beginning slides was just, uh, you know, putting that into the context, the museum as an empowering institution, and it is for the common man. You know, anybody can walk into a museum, provided there is no ticketing, if ticketing, take a ticket and get in. But yes, of course, uh, you know, one can appreciate the achievement of his own her culture and their heritage, and the scientific know-how which has been evolving throughout time. Uh, one spends enough time, one could transform depending on the time it spent. So it's a mutual win-win situation from the museum and the visitor, how much time we spend and what is the attitude we are getting in, and then how much facilitation the museum is doing from its side. So all of us know museum uh, is a catalyst for change as for the present of the need of the present day. We could look at this as an engine uh, for taking the society further, whether as Ms. Chen said, whether it is, and you know, on the about the rivers or the environmental education or maybe the climate change, or it is a community development for craft and sustainability, or then supporting them for their sustainability through the health and mental health and the physical health and other related things. So we could spread out, we could collaborate, we could join hands to do, uh, make museum more powerful. We are doing in our own domains, but we could have to spread out. Of course, off late, the museums are you know, redefining the role because now the ICOM is redefining the definition uh, and then negotiating. And then we are uh, contesting on it 
uh, you know, what the new definition could be acceptable to the changing environment, the changing global perspective. And then, of course, we from Indian context, we are now focusing more on vocal for local and Atma Nirbhar because we want it to be more self-sustainable and self-sufficient to make ourselves, you know, locally uh, more identifiable and uh, contributing to the growth of the sector, but still lifting ourselves to the global perspective. So from local to global will be our dimension. So education is one of the main dimension in it. And we are also taking the education into the experiential notions of uh, ed edutainment from, uh, uh, cross reference from the panelists talking on the educational perspective and the experimental perspectives. Uh, yes, I've been uh, being a museum professional when I was I started my career as an assistant professor teaching archaeology and taking care of the archaeology museum. Moved on to museum studies in 2014 as an associate professor and then later becoming the head department of museum studies. Collaborating with uh, getting into ICOM and uh, putting my a lot of energy to you know do activities uh, in ICOM India chapter in, in India. Uh, all my experience looking and interacting with various museum professionals in the museum sector, uh, what I find is that we need to uh, create the product value. You know, the museum has to bring in more value as a, as a cultural heritage product, whether it is a science museum or it is an art museum. Uh, so the power of the museum could be, you know, felt and understood by the community, the society, only when we could create the product value. Uh, by education or maybe inclusion or maybe branding, marketing, whatever uh, steps, ways and means of measures we take up in our own demands, uh, targeting different target groups, as Ms. Uh, Chen said, because you have the program for the youngsters, you have the program for the you know, brand ambassador as the youngster who taking care of you know, branding it. So what way we want to brand it and outreach, but we have ways and means of doing it. I think we all have to take it up further. Uh, coming down to, uh, I just wanted to highlight on dioramas because when we talk of community, when we look at many of the museums in India, especially the uh, social science museums, the museums from art and history and cultural heritage and the multi-purpose museums, we, uh, when we talk of community, the first thing comes to my mind as a child when I was looking at the museums, it was like the dioramas, you know, the dioramas which depicts the community. Now we have moved on a long way to the virtual screens and the digital screens and the you know, and the you know, way of looking at it in a different perspective. But of course, the dioramas, the folk stories, the folk songs, the performances, they all play a very wonderful, effective role in making, connecting us with the community. I would take uh, two examples in my talk today to talk about museums and its empowerment as far as community is concerned. And that too, I'm not taking simple examples, not because I'm from the, I am uh, belong to the region of Gujarat where I'm, my working uh, ground is, uh, you know, located. But this is happening throughout India at different pockets. But I'm just lifting up only two examples to just to see how things are happening in India and how fast we are changing in terms of empowering our museums and using museum to empower the society. A vice versa, a mutual win-win situation. This is an example from uh, Gujarat, where uh, the western part of India, the state of Gujarat. Uh, a center called Bhasha Center, which is established in 1996. This has been established by a university uh, professor, basically uh, Dr. Ganesh Devi, who was an English professor, was instrumental in making this possible. Now they have collaboration with uh, UNESCO and a lot of funding coming from various international organization. But the prime of fo focus of this establishment of this museum, the Adivasi Center, Adivasi means the tribal, the tribal center, for the development of Adivasi language, protection of their language, their folk songs, their uh, traditions. So a museum started, which is called as Wacha. Wacha means museum of voice. So it was for giving voice to the community, giving power to the community. Uh, the community exists there since long. They still uh, are living traditions. They have a lot of practices, but Wacha has become, Wacha became, the museum of voice has become a power tool the museum become a, a powerful engine to take this community further, make their traditions alive, protect their practices, document their you know dying practices, uh, local dialects, uh, traditions, music, 
and their festivals. So, so the example, a powerful example of a museum as a powerhouse to support and empower the community to preserve their culture, preserve their traditions, not just documenting and supporting them, but also training them where the lady who is in this picture whom I am standing, she is explaining me the museum. She's a tribal lady. So it was an exercise where, you know, you were training the local, the tribal, you know, individuals who are good in speaking, good in expression, train them how to narrate, how to explain the museum and its collection. So they, you know, a bit trust building in a terms of empowerment and economically they become stronger because they are getting some revenue for this job and also trust building and power building where this collection belongs to them. This museum belongs to them. They run it. So a kind of, you know, uh, situations where the museum is a laboratory, UNESCO helps. The museum started with uh, experts coming in, giving talks and things like that. But a very, uh, I should say, very, very well, strong bonded uh, synchronization between the community and the museum and the experts coming in, which has made this institution to grow a uh, uh, great extent. And it has its own landmark now. It is on its own identity now. And uh, now they have come up with schools and hospital and for the tribal benefits. They're talking on uh, global warming. They're talking about the environmental education. They're talking about climate change. Uh, I've not touched upon those slides because there's large number of activities they are doing. And they are also uh, getting empowered because they, they know what is the climate change. They know the seasonality. They know the cultivation which is to be done, the agricultural turnover and the kind of seasons to be, which kind of, uh, you know, uh, crop should be done and then how it should be taken care of. Not only just looking after the museum, but a lot of festivity in connection with the rituals in terms of the cultivation, the first cultivation, the, the reaping of the, you know, cultivated products. So, you know, a lot of agriculture, a lot of land revenue and forest related issues. So I, I feel there was a lot of deforestation was happening that has been cut down to a great extent now. And also they're getting more educated in terms of their health issues because they started a hospital. So a holistic you know, experimentation is happening through this museum, a true power tool and as a powerhouse, the museum as a powerhouse. A second example which I would love to pull out is a museum which is known as Kalareksha, which is in the Kutch region of Gujarat, which is a borderland in between India and Pakistan. Has a lot of the community there has a lot of shared heritage between India and Pakistan in their uh, performances, in their traditions, their lifestyle. Here, this Kalareksha, a small museum, was started uh, maybe early 80s. Uh, it play a big role in a sense where women empowerment this. In the picture, what you see is uh, you know, an expert who has actually started with this museum, Judy, and the elders. Now, let me tell you, share you the experience here. This elders has been uh, doing a lot of embroidery work and craft. Uh, they are known for that. They, they are different kind of communities. They are colorful. They have, their identity comes to their embroidery work. Identity comes to their costumes they wear. So, you know, there are large number of communities, but they have their own identity. Now, this few communities are very well known for a special kind of thread work and embroidery, which is off late, is, you know, out of the scene, or maybe people are not practicing it. The younger generation is not ready to take up this because it is not empowering them as far as revenue is concerned. A lot of urbanization is happening. So they would look for an industrial job in the industrial areas rather than doing this craft. So this museum basically, uh, is doing a play, uh, playing a role in between the elders and the youngsters, the next generation, where uh, you know the knowledge transfer, the you know making these elders to come and talk about the stitches, the embroideries, they make blueprints because it's in their mind because they were you know extensively doing in their lifetime, so they could just translate it into you know small stitches and the drawings and sketches, and museum takes it up to uh, next level. Uh, let me share the next slide where the museum connect with the, you know, uh, design institutes, a large number of design institute across, which creates commercially viable designs products. So the traditional designs translated into commercially viable designs, incorporating an amalgamation of both, bringing about products. Uh, in this picture, I don't know whether it is visible to you here. This is a picture where uh, textile 
uh, wall hanging, but that has a board game where snake and ladder board game. So, you know, this product has been created by these people and the board game not is on a paper on a plastic or a mount but it's on a textile format it can be used as wall hanging it can be used as a game board so the same tradition of a game which has been played translated into a textile format with you know patches and designs and uh, you know uh, a lot of elements getting into it and then bringing it as a commercially viable product and museum bridge between the other non-governmental organizations and the community to give them more, uh, you know, sustainability in terms of selling their products. Here in the next picture is the youngsters, the, the, the younger generations, the, uh, the the earlier one where the mother-in-laws, now they are the, you know, the daughters, daughter-in-laws. Now they are in the family, they are earlier only doing, you know, taking care of the family, their children and the cattle rearing. Now, after finishing their housework, they come to the museum for half day or maybe they are full day. Sometimes they finish their work in the morning hours and come. They do the stitching. They learn this new designs. And these all people now have a bank account. They get this, you know, their remuneration run through. You know, they all have getting half money in their hand. So empowerment, empowering women, elder generation and the younger generation. The museum is a playing a vital role making their heritage their craft as a brand product commercially viable to the international platforms but at the same time knowledge transfer the knowledge is not getting died it's transferred uh, originally as well as modified way both way so i think when you talk of uh, sustainability and now miss chen i would like to try to bring your attention here because now other organizations are communicating with them talking about mental health and physical health and hygienic issues you know and these ladies are getting even that kind of information from this museum and museum is collaborating with other organization to bring in that dimension to their life and their ecology and their uh, you know living systems and habitats to become more and more hygienically uh, you know um, you know otherwise i feel sometimes they are some of them not all but some areas are vulnerable where need to be uh, you know treated with in terms of they are more into traditional approaches and uh, superstitious beliefs and things like that not all but some so there's a lot of work has to be done in that direction so these are two things which i wanted to highlight in terms of sustainability and how museum could be a engine how the power of the museum could be reach out to the community to when we talk museums are the social entities for the you know for for the benefit of the society so in true sense uh, we could make a difference uh, for a moment i will take you to an another example of my own institutions where uh, institution where i am working we have a small museum where uh, as i said we are in the faculty of fine arts where we have neighborhoods uh, sculpture department the sculptors the painters the printmakers so the museum the department of museum studies with this museum is a powerhouse to curate exhibitions help the artists to do their uh, exhibitions conserve their collection maintain their collection we deal with the storage we deal with the marketing we deal with museum education so uh, i along with my uh, i also as the head but i get down to the museum and do activities whenever i get time do we have researchers and the others are doing it uh, so this is a session we do for the children to appreciate art look at art look at you know various dimensions of sculptural art paintings and miniature paintings and things like that and we use a lot of storytelling to make them understand uh, you know these objects in a better way so that they could connect with their childhood they connect art in a better perspective here we use a lot of uh, taxidermy specimen we have uh, some taxidermy specimen in our collection we have some birds and animals, which is a stuffed one. So we also talk about the taxidermy as a museum technique and also use that specimen to talk about the environment, the flora and fauna and the climate and the climatic changes and connecting with art and look at the miniature paintings, how the flora and fauna is represented on this miniature paintings of India of different schools of art. So bringing in, you know, Flora Fauna to connect with mean, you know, this miniature paintings as well as making meaning of miniature paintings and its uh, themes. So we, we are trying with different perspective and multidisciplinary perspective doing all those things. Um, of course, we deal with uh, uh, children who have special children with autism and Down syndrome. 
so they are special to us so we do a lot of activities for the special children uh, uh, we get them uh, this is for me a, a double beneficial situation where i take uh, this opportunity to give them an extension activity so the museology students who are learning museum studies will develop that attitude and empathy towards looking at this uh, segment of the society the the marginalized society who needs us uh, who needs our empathy and who needs our help to understand and we should spare the museum spaces for them you know the space become a space for them also to come in so uh, an aspect of inclusion and access and use this space in terms of uh, i'm not saying we could evaluate how much they learn we are not there to teach them we are there to give them a space to come and then enjoy and spare some time listen to music listen to some stories we say look at some of the object we show them do some art activities undergo an art therapy session where you know even some of my students play uh, guitar to uh, you know entertain them so it's basically the museology students get trained accordingly so that when they become the museum professionals and taking responsibility in various museums know how to deal with this segment and also outreach them in the proper sense so i take maximum benefit of all these events all these occasions uh we are also trying to this is an example from smithsonian institution where he has an ex, uh, i had an opportunity but we are developing something like the discovery boxes for various uh, types of objects in the sense various themes for science for art for fine art this is ongoing uh i also interact with large number of museums uh not only as a president i come india but as a professional who is training future museum professionals uh so i mentioned in the beginning itself like uh, vocal for local is one of the thing we are pitching in and also self sufficiency in maintaining communicating and outreaching uh when we look at the smaller museums uh, across india the rural museums uh, the mu museums in the remote areas we have our own difficulties we have difficulties in terms of constraints of maintenance communication outreach staff finance infrastructure a lot of things but we are trying to uh, you know do the best keeping our priorities and constraints balancing so that what best we could do and take it further and i feel in that dimension volunteering program is one of the issue where i think we really are uh, strategizing where uh, we could take volunteers but we really have to make procedures and policies and strategies for what volunteer could do and what we we could do for them for training them bit of orientation and what levels of jurisdiction we can allow them and take their help to do our activities wherever we have a shortage of staff wherever uh, you know uh, problem with uh, networking or maybe human resources could be utilized through the volunteering program and uh, with this i think i would conclude and thank you so much uh, the um, you know ncsm and the rest of the panel for giving me this opportunity for sharing my thoughts and thank you so much thank you thank you professor patel for that uh, delightful presentation um uh, that it was very interesting to hear that example of museum of voice where uh, we are preserving and protecting language of the tribes and a strong bonding uh, now exists between the community and the museum which in terms uh, helps the museum to become a powerhouse or power tool for the local community and of course the kala shilpa project uh, where you have said that museums are making a particular product as a brand product product and empowering sustainability and uh, storytelling sessions in your department which uh, enables the students to appreciate the sculptures and um, art therapy for the special children which again demonstrates the power of the museums thank you professor patel thank you once again thank you so much i would just request if i could quit or i should wait for some questions yes uh, i was also uh, requesting i was asking our uh, museology students of the university of calcutta who are present here if they have any questions they can uh, ask professor patel or the other speakers
Shibrasad sir and Nandakur ji and Miss Chen. I am actually traveling in between. I am on way I and I uh, halted myself to have this and few other sessions in the day. So uh, uh, if any questions, I'll answer definitely. But then I would uh, take your permission yeah, and from Rajiv Nadji also and from Subriyo ji, I could see he's there. Now I could see him uh, because you moved the camera that direction. <laughs> uh, greetings to Subriyo ji. And, uh, uh, and I think, sir, with your permission, if there is no question, uh, maybe I could uh, take your leave. Uh, I think there is yeah. a question for you before you just leave from, from our <laughs> museology students. Please. Good uh, brief. Uh, I want to ask that uh, what museum can do for the mental health uh, situation? Can, can you keep the mic a little, uh, little because it's getting low? I'm sorry, I'm not getting you because there was a lot of vibration. She I'm not able to hear you. She wants to know what the museums can do for the mentally, um, mental health, mentally differently able. Okay, okay. So uh, we are actually now trying to do something. We actually designed uh, an event for uh, mentally challenged children. We have been uh, uh, from the Department of Museum Studies after I took over in 2019, we have been extensively dealing with some NGOs who has uh, one of them is the Disha Foundation who, who actually do a lot of activity for the children from streets, the children from slums, the children from uh, the physically and mentally challenged children. So this organization in collaboration with the department, we are doing, uh, we actually uh, started doing some of the session where the museology student go to that organization and observe. It's an empirical uh, observational study to see the behavior pattern and to understand what are their difficulties and what way we could help them because they are not trained. So we really have to understand them to, you know, organize ourselves and uh, design our programs. So along with the NGO, um, to answer this girl, uh, along with the NGO, we have been designing some uh, mental health related programs where we have done two art therapy sessions where this art therapy was for the museology students where we have been training them how to make certain uh, you know, therapy sessions and train themselves when they deal with this, uh, you know, children with difficulties. And we have done two sessions with them. We have not done it in the department. We went to the NGO and in their premises these children are more comfortable so we have dealt with two sessions with them talking to them telling them story so this was an exercise we started way back in 2019 and then in between there's a gap for covid we have done something in 18 we have done something in 19 and then now in uh, 18 somewhere in between we got some children who are you know we we become comfortable that we could help them and we could interact with them and that will be beneficial to them so that's why we got the autistic children first and then we also uh, you know and when okay let me tell you one thing very frankly when we were dealing with autistic children the disha foundation uh, has given us 10 children they said okay we are sending 10 children together but they are in different spectrum of autistic you know uh, problems so they are you know we can't say one we have we, when they came to us, when we were using the museum space, uh, one of my students was playing uh, uh, guitar, one was telling story, one was handling them. We only had 10 students at one batch. And then one was doing uh, art activity. So we divided, you know, they are, you know, 10 into five group, uh, sorry, five groups with two children. And then we find, no, we are not able to manage them. So we, we have distributed individually museology students for individual student uh, this disabled child and two tutors from their organization so they have been dealing with them so they know how to deal with them but still we find two of them are so aggressive they did not want to stay in the museum they want to go away so for us also we are learning from how to deal with them but we were doing all this activity with the help of the organization and the therapist who were doing this since long for them so uh, so when you ask me about the mental health, yes, definitely we are, we are going to continue with this, this kind of therapy sessions. But let me tell you one thing very frankly, as far as autism is concerned, Down syndrome is concerned, I think we need to have individual attention to individual uh, students, uh, individual child who is coming to us. So we really have to design uh, programs for, you know, with the help of the trainers from there. Mm -hmm. So we have done few art therapy. 
uh, we are designing some program, but I think we will open up uh, so as soon it comes because we are now working on it. But we will definitely coming in short time in August, some program in those lines for mental health. And I would appreciate if the students from Museology of Calcutta University join us in that session online because we will do it hybrid. Uh, so definitely we will give you more inputs and more uh, you know understanding in those directions when you become a part of it. It is an experiential learning because if I speak, you know, we'll do this model, that model. One has to be really getting into it and doing it because when I was doing it, I was thinking, oh, I have observed uh, so many activities abroad when I was doing different fellowships. But when I did individually, I find the difficulties dealing with it. And, you know, every activity we were doing was a learning experience for us. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we, we put it as doing and learning for the mesology student, for me, but trying to help them whatever smaller bits we could do. Yes. And uh, we, had, uh, we are also doing a uh, planning. We are actually in, in a negotiation now dealing with few museums, using their spaces for performances. And uh, I find one or two of these autistic children are, you know, uh, and two of the partially blind students, but we have a tactile uh, event few months back uh, in Ma 11th of March. And I find they are good in performances, you know. So we really have to tap what exactly, you know, they are good so that they're mental issues could be, uh, you know, supportive. So I a, a huge uh, area to work in this direction. And we have put just small steps into it. Yeah. Yes. So once again, thank you, Professor Patel. And uh, she's just uh, yes. OK. OK, uh, thank you, Professor Patel, once again, from our side. And, uh, and we'll have our next speaker now. Our next speaker today is. You can go, madam. I mean, she's traveling. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be in touch with you, all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Our fourth speaker today is uh, currently the head of the Department of Museology in the University of Calcutta and the board mem member of ECOFORM, that is the International, Count, uh, Counts, International Council for Museology, I suppose. He has worked in different museums at various capacities, including heading the Maritime Museum. And thereafter, he has been in the teaching profession at the University of Calcutta. He has to his credit more than 50 research papers and has been a PhD supervisor for a number of scholars. He is in the editorial board of several national and international research journals. He is a member of ICOM since 1988 and also a life member of Museum Association and the Asiatic Society. Please welcome Dr. Supriya Chando. Uh, Dr. Supriya. Chando will be delivering his lecture in-house from BITM itself. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's always nice to be back to the great institution where I started my museum career long back in 1988. Though I continued for only for five years, then uh, left the organization in 1993. But still, uh, the institution of National Council of Science Museums is uh, very close to my heart. I still consider myself as consider myself as uh, you know one of the NCSM person. You know, after uh, hearing the beautiful lectures, uh, also. I'm a bit uh, apprehensive in opening my big mouth. Uh, Mr. Kenneth might understand what I want to uh, you know, communicate. You see, every year we know the ICOM comes up with uh, lots of amb ambitious, if I shouldn't, uh, you know, I shouldn't use the word word topics on the IMD. Since 1977, we have been uh, seeing the ambitious, you know, 
topics like the society, diversity, inclusion, sustainable development, future, future of museums, etc., culminating in this year, the power of museums. When I saw the pro, you know the topic, I was uh, a bit surprised. To me, you know, museum power. What power? You know, we are we always relate power with the political entities, especially in in the Southeast Asian countries. We we had been seeing that where the powers are being enjoyed by the political bosses or even the non-political bosses who are the mafias or the economical giants. So what power the museums will have? Do we have the museum curators or the museum directors? Do they have the power to decide on their own you know, uh, that topics? What to display? Are they allowed to have their political independence? Are they allowed to decide their the topics, what they want to exhibit? We know being most of the museums run by the federal funding, the directors and the curators are always working on the razor's edge, balancing their existence not being guillotined. So, and what power the museums would yield and for whom? Then I read the aims of the IMD 2022. Again, there are some, you know, over ambitious words coined there, power to transform. Power to transform the world, is it so easy? Is it really a place of diversity? And see, the word they use teach us about our past as if present doesn't exist at all. Open our minds to new ideas. And then for whom? Then they claim that they explored the potential of museums to bring about positive changes through three lenses. The sustainability, digitalization, accessibility, and education. Then it become a bit clear. See, none of the three lenses need any political or economic powers. So again, we are handed over a rattle to just to, you know, pacify a crying child. Let us explore the, the two, two of the new definitions. Those are scheduled to be discussed in uh, the Prague 2020-22, ICOM Prague 2022 in the August. And most probably the second one will be accepted. Again, see some of the very obsolete terms are still being used. Permanent, not for profit, in both the uh, definitions. Service to society, sustainable manner, education, besides reflection and enjoyment, diversity, and the knowledge sharing. You see, does museum really provide education? Is it an educational institution? Rather, the museums or museological practices always aims to give a learning experience. Many of us were in favor of using the word learning, but again, the political considerations came into the way 
because most of the countries from the southern america and some of the asian countries they favored the detaining the word education because unless the education is not there they won't have access to the government grants see see the amount of power the museums enjoy and again in that in the name of diversity as we know the michel foucault always explained museums as heterotopic spaces but in the definition and other uh, the other uh, you know the documents in our uh, in our hand we are trying to make museums to be a utopia to make in the in the in the in turn we are we are trying to make it a dystopic space when nothing works in favor of the society and it, let let me explain one by one the working groups i comes working groups uh, you know on sustain, sustainability they come out, they, they actually stresses on several factors last year the stresses on the four targets ensure equal access achieving higher level of economic productivity promoting mechanism for raising capacity for climate change and strengthen efforts to protect and safeguard the world's cultural and natural heritage except the four four uh, the fourth one none of the three focuses in fact materialized through the museums world over for digitalization we all know the things the way the communication devices evolved evolved over the year compelling the museums to make their uses but still are museums attract more visitors just let me explain or concentrate on the average age age groups especially those are born during or after 1995 they have exceptional attachment to the digital media that is this uh, this a uh, bit uh, old figure just before the pandemic or during the first wave of pandemic these there were 30 million viewers per day of youtube 2.8 billion viewers per month of for facebook 20 million viewers users of twitter 722 million, million users for linkedin for instagram 854.5 million users and 2 billion users for whatsapp besides pinterest telegram and other so many social media especially the young one they have exceptional attachment to the social media they have exceptional attachment to the digital media they want to create content and they want to become a part of content and this is the most probably the temporary phase every one and half years you have to change your devices at your disposal the speed as you see daily is used in our mobile phones maximum whatever costly device you buy you have to change it within two, two years with more power more processing power more storage space that means you have to be more mobile your devices needs to have more mobility you have augmented access to the information a quick 
access culminating into the my media and very soon it will surpass mass media then what we the, what the museum will do content creation will explode so naturally the first two lenses there is sustainability this is beyond the purview of the museum in fact mr kenneth might remember that this particular organization bill industrial and technological museum started a novel project in the early 80s on the sustainability with that the community called Kerala Shoppers in Purulia district and the district science center Purulia facilitated the pro program. The museum used to transfer technology. They used to buy their products. They used to manage marketing their their produces. But again, the the tag that is that is also not removed. That is not for profit. That came came into the way. And you might remember the flat the then director Mr. Shomar Bakshi had to face both indoor and outdoor. And ultimately, the project had project died prematurely. Now, after so many years, we are again propagating for sustainability. But we have the museums have the tag not for profit institution. So you are asking to jump into the river. Binding your hands and legs. So, so naturally, what would be more an advantage is for the NGOs. They are running the show in the name of sustainability. The, the scrupulous, you know, NGOs have their loot and destroying the. Cultural or natural heritages, in the name of sustainable development, and there are many gurus also in the market. So the true lens is sustainable development, and digitization is probably not fit into the domain of the museum, especially in the Indian context. Now come to the third one, that is education or capacity building. That is a bit possible, at least in our condition. That may be possible with the institutional collaboration. What we are having, especially the ITM in and, and my department, we are having active collaboration for years, especially during the last two years. While we didn't have the possibility of physically visiting the museums, the NCSM, the BITM, and other museums also, collaborated. We collaborated with them and arranged for virtual museum visit in real time. That helped the students to complete complete their courses on time. Even last year, another exceptionally Innovative project was taken up by the uh, BITM. With our collaborative effort, they in fact conducted the internship pro project for the students, three months intensive internship project, and ultimately followed by some physical activities after. Uh, the wave was su somewhat subsided, but most of the pro most of the time, the program held online only. And for that to be successful in education, you need to have mutual respect with the visitors, with the institutions, with your clients. 
you need to identify the needs and you have to develop the programs according to the needs but will that be so possible i must come to the back of the back to the basic the poster being circulated throughout the media throughout the world the power of museums again i am coming to the basic questions power for whom and for whose benefit see the picture to me it appears to be the powers are concentrated on the above and trickling down drop by drop to the begging arm begging hands bottom at the bottom so what power we are giving to our visitors what respects we are having to our clients not as the museums or museologists the highest body the international council of museums they have designed such i don't know the logic behind it but to a layman of understanding a little understanding of the art and graphics etc it seems to me that we have very least respect to the receivers can any project any topic any big words be, be successful with such mean minded attitude that's what i had to say thank you Uh, thank you, Professor Chandu. Uh, it was a great hearing from you regarding the uh, project uh, we had taken, BITM had taken up with the museology department a few months back, and you talked about this regarding uh, in your uh, slide where you showed the community building through education and uh, what the future holds for the content creation. That was also very interesting. and very nice to hear from you thank you dr chandu once again our fifth speaker today is shri tarun thakral ji shri tarun thakral is the founder and managing trustee of the heritage transport museum most of you i hope you know about this heritage transport museum which is located near gurgaon and has in its display more than 3500 curated objects which we were tale of india's uh, transportation history sri tarun thakral who is primarily a hotelier but to pursue his hobby and passion in vintage and classic cars sri thakral developed this comprehensive transport museum named heritage transport museum in 2013 since its opening the museum has inspired uh, more than 1 million visitors these visitors have comprised of school children Uh, who have come through organized school trips university students domestic and foreign tourist groups architects designers researchers the museum has won many national and international awards including the prestigious national tourism award for being the most innovative and unique tourism project in the country shri thakral today actively divides his role in the hospitality hospitality industry as well as in the museum field sitarun thakral ji uh sir uh, we can't hear you clearly the voice is you're not audible sir
Hmm? Uh, still not audible, sir. Huh? Oh, you are muted, sir. Unmute, correction. So I think it's better you, you leave the meeting and you rejoin one second. Can you just sir, uh, leave it and rejoin one second, sir? Um, yes, yes, now it's perfect. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, everyone um, and it was great listening to all the uh, the panel speakers um, it gave me a very different perspective of uh, how we pursue uh, our museums and our national uh, science center and especially the birla industrial and technological museum is uh, you know doing such a wonderful job uh, thank you icom also for letting me you know um, join this discussion um, I'm just going to share my screen. I hope I can do that. Yes. One second, I just one, one moment. Uh, sorry, I'm a little technologically challenged. No, uh, it's okay, sir. Where we can, can see. Okay, okay, you can see. Oh no. Oh yes or no? No. Uh, right now we cannot. Okay. Yes, yes. Now, now it's okay. perfect. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, just to give you a brief introduction, because many of you may not have heard about the Heritage Transport Museum, we opened about eight years back. Um, sir, can you just make it full screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Heritage Transport Museum opened in the, on the outskirts of Delhi and Gurgaon in 2013. We are India's first comprehensive transport museum, spread on three acres of land, with a built-up area of about 100,000 square feet. Uh, the reason why this museum was created was that we had a huge collection of uh, vintage classic cars various modes of transportation from carriages to carts to railways and we didn't know what to do with it um, so we did approach the ministry of culture government of india we got a grant and then we built this uh, museum and one of the key things while we were building this museum was that we do not want to be a regular museum what india had we wanted a place where youngsters as well as adults can come in and actually uh, get inspired. Uh, I'm proud to say that we have been able to achieve that. Uh, despite COVID, uh, you know, we, we are still, we have sustained ourselves as an individual private trust, not-for-profit trust that we are, which manages and operates the museum. We've been able to successfully, uh, you know, manage uh, our show. Uh, before, uh, you know, I 
talk more about the museum and also about how education has been imparted through various ways. I'd like to show you a, just a two minute film on the museum so that everybody is on the same page. All right, um, as I mentioned, uh, this is India's first transport museum, uh, which depicts public and private modes of transportation. We've not gone into the army or any other kind of vehicles. We've focused uh, ourselves. The museum itself is spread on over 100,000 fully air conditioned space uh, with exhibition galleries, library reference center, auditorium, seminar rooms, uh, and uh, we also have three and a half acres of gardens with us uh, where we typically have events, outdoor events, so that uh, we are in a position to sustain ourselves. Uh, there, there, is a, there are varied programs for both tourists as well as uh, schools, uh, besides, of course, family visitors, whom, which we focus on the weekends. Um, basically, um, uh, it's... Uh, everything to do with how people of India have traveled, as I mentioned, and uh, the popular exhibits of the, uh, at the museum include a toy bird cart from, uh, sorry, uh, from the Indus Valley civilization, the only Indian flag that has been to the moon and back. It had gone on one of the Apollo missions, um, a Piper aircraft, um, a st working steam locomotive. Uh, we have three steam locomotives, uh, one of them which we have made it functional. Uh, we have a 1940s tram from the city of Kolkata, uh, the, only, the last surviving wood-bodied tram which we had acquired about three years back and we've restored it uh, to its perfection. I'll talk about it more later in the education section. Uh, what's been our success so far? Uh, I mean, number one, we, we have treated the museum like a hotel, a five-star hotel or like a, uh, uh, like, like, a, like a project which is visitor-centric. And if the visitor goes back with a positive experience, 
he's going to go and tell about 20,000 other people that, you know, go to that museum. It's a beautiful place. It's a different kind of a place. And that's how our visitor count has grown year on year. Pre-COVID, we virtually had about 20 to 30 percent increase in visitors every year. Uh, we have kept our uh, storyline very simple. We want people, uh, visitors, to actually come and experience and get their stories out rather than we telling them anything about, you know, I mean, we give the basic descriptions, but there are so many transportation stories that all of us, as we have grown up, uh, seeing the first car that either our family possessed or our neighbors possessed or a distant relative uh, possessed, that those whole stories come back to light. Uh, my first Lambretta scooter, my first Vespa scooter. Uh, that's been the biggest and the most positive part about the, the museum. In fact, uh, there was a talk earlier on today um, in, in the panel about mixing of art, culture, and with you know technological museums. We have done that. We have had various artists that have commissioned artworks, installations at the museum. Um, and what that and what that has resulted in a complete shift when you see objects, when you see vintage cars, for example, one after the other, it breaks the monotony of seeing cars because you actually lose interest after seeing five, seven of them together. So you know, there's an art installation there. They may be pertaining to transport, but depicted, depicted in a very modern way. And that's what has broken the monotony of seeing old objects all the time. And I think that's, uh, I think all the museums should follow it because it just, uh, number one, breaks the monotony. It also allows the people to breathe fresh air, I think, you know, in some form or the other. Plus, then you also are able to attract, uh, you know, larger family groups. Uh, maybe the, the lady of the house is not interested in transport, but when she sees art installations, she may be interested in that. Maybe a, a parent may not be interested in seeing an art installation, but he may be interested in seeing you know, a howdah or a, or a palki. So there is something for everybody that this, mu that this museum provides. We've also followed the theatrical approach, wherein every object is actually an actor. The way the museum is designed, it's got multiple atriums within uh, its space, and it's like an object talking to each other. For example, a car talking to an aircraft, or an aircraft talking to a carriage or a palanquin or a bus talking to, you know, a, a, a cycle. So that's what, uh, when you look at it visually, it's, it's a very appealing kind of a place. And that's one of our uh, successes also. Now, coming back to education, how have we, you know, how is the community involved? How has education played a major role? Uh, Transportation, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it has its important and a very important um, aspect in how the society has changed over time. Uh, there is history in terms of the craftsmanship of these objects. There is something to learn how these objects have evolved over a period of time. Today we sit in a modern car, you know, press the automatic uh, gear, uh, gear, gear lever and just drive off. Uh, remember those days when uh, the ambassador used to get heated up, when we used to go on the hills, we used to stop the cars and, you know, put uh, water in them to cool the engine uh, down. So there's a great uh, education in the evolution of transportation. Uh, so when you look at that part of the education, uh, especially when school children come, uh, they get to learn about uh, about, about the evolution. They, we conduct inter interactive uh, uh, guides uh, uh, with them. We have audio guides, which uh, we recently in in introduced 
uh, VR. Uh, we also have simulator rides. So we, we in, 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 a, in a nutshell, we have tried to, we, we go across them. We actually curate a, a school visit prior uh, to the school coming so that we know exactly what the, uh, what the students are looking for. Uh, our, our team is there all the time to guide them. Uh, then we also have, uh, you know, uh, and the education of the museum over the last few years has evolved into uh, through some dynamic exhibitions that we have uh, had during the course of uh, the last few years. And I think that's been even a better success than what the objects of are present at the museum. Uh, these um, are held at the various um, uh, areas within the museum, as well as a dedicated area for holding exhibitions. And I'll go, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, of these uh, dynamic exhibitions that we've had so that um, uh, you can get a point, uh, get, get an, a sense of what I'm trying to say. Uh, the first one was the education, uh, I mean, the Calcutta tram, which I think is a living her heritage and people of Kolkata are, uh, are very proud, although, although at times, you know, there are, uh, there's always that story of whether they're useful anymore or they're not useful anymore. Why were they not, um, uh, Evolve, uh, why were they not upgraded at the right time? Uh, so if you enter our Calcutta tram, uh, our, our tram, which, which was uh, 204, uh, 1940s wood-bodied tram, uh, after being fully restored, we've had, uh, we have two screens in each car, uh, which, uh, where we have footage, uh, vintage footage of the trams in operation in Calcutta as well as Mumbai and Delhi. Uh, those uh, play there. And in the other uh, tram car, in the, in, the, in the other car, we have, um, we have shot videos while sitting in a Calcutta tram and traveling. So, and we just shot the street scenes. So it's like you are currently traveling in this tram and what you see of Calcutta, the, the, the mixture of people uh, the fruit wallas, the, the the noises of Calcutta. So that's a very interesting experience. So if you sit there for 15 minutes, you actually feel you've actually taken a ride in the car, in, in, in a tram. Um, mind you, being in North India, uh, not many people were aware of the trams. Uh, and even Delhi's, uh, I think the last tram in Delhi uh, functioned in way back in 1954. And I think Bombay, if I'm not mistaken, was 1964. So not many people have been aware of, uh, of trams. Uh, we also have history of the tramways um, of other cities besides Kolkata. Uh, that's Bombay, uh, Delhi, and even Madras had some had, had trams which operated on two sectors. Uh, so that's one thing which is ongoing. Um, this is a great learning experience for, um, and it, people just suddenly get to know and they learn it and they don't forget about it because it's presented in such an interesting way. Um, there's another project that we had started called Street Jewelry. Uh, by street, street Jewelry, we mean, uh, you know, the various decorations that used to take place on our trucks, on our uh, streets, on, uh, and these were done by artists. Um, you know, they had that typical typeface when they used to write uh, things, which over the over the over the past few years have actually gone into oblivion. I should say, uh, those artists have now started using stickers, uh, chamakpatti, as some people call it, or reflective stickers, as some people say. So the trend from actually hand painting art has gone to uh, you know. Uh, sticker art, uh, which is easier. They'll just stick, uh, cut stickers and they'll put it across. Now, at the museum, all the shutters um, at, in, inside the museum were painted by these artists. So you actually don't feel that it's a shutter. It looks like it's, it's a piece of art uh, or an artwork. Similarly, uh, we found very interesting um, hand-decorated uh, uh, rickshaws uh, in uh, 
Allahabad, and we actually um, got one of them there just to show it to, to, to uh, you know, the visitors that how intricately uh, decorations are being carried about. I think all over in, in, in part of Sri Lanka, part of Bangladesh, even Pakistan, Pakistan is famous for its truck art. Uh, and we have had a, a couple of Pakistani artists also coming to our uh, museum and actually creating uh, some interesting, uh, you know, artworks on vehicles. Uh, besides this, we also have a, a, a section called uh, Jugaad Transport. You know, how important Jugaad Transport or, you know, uh, the transport that we Indians uh, are famous at in terms of, you know, trying to modify things and make it to our to suit our convenience. We have uh, we've had we have those vehicles also. We've collected them. Some of them have actually been banned in India because of pollution norms. But from smaller towns, we've been able to get that. And that also farm, uh, forms a part of the street jewelry section. This again not only are we preserving this artwork, we are also imparting the education to uh, youngsters as to how things were at a given point of time. And not only have we done that, we are also, you know, trying to preserve these artisans in some form or the other by inviting them, offering them certain amounts of money to so that their livelihoods can go on. And looking at us, there are many other people who have wanted to do this kind of an art, uh, which has now evolved in, you know, even decoration pieces. These artists actually have got a livelihood uh, in, uh, you know, doing smaller decoration pieces. Uh, one of our most successful exhibitions, uh, which ran for almost about four months, was Bollywood and Transport Connect. Everybody, uh, you know, eyes open up and said, what is this uh, Bollywood and Transport Connect? Now, uh, if you look at uh, cinemas, uh, and this is right from the 1950s, uh, even 47, 48, until today. Uh, whenever a transport uh, mode, which is used in the film, finds a part in its poster, its advertising poster, that means that there is a certain significance of that particular vehicle uh, in, uh, in, in that movie. Um, you know, many of you... Uh, uh, would be movie buffs um, like like I am, and I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, when you look at uh, you know uh, the, the actor, you know, jumping out of a train or you know somebody riding a motorcycle or actually you know going on a um, car chase in a movie. And so what we did was um, we had this collection of when transportation connected with. Uh, Bollywood and cinema, uh, posters, lobby cards. Uh, this is one of our very successful exhibitions because people could relate to uh, not only the mode of transport, but also they, they got reminded of, uh, you know, the, the, the movie itself or that particular scene itself. Uh, so whenever, whenever people get involved in an exhibition, I think not only... Um, from an education point of view, they've learned something. They have actually tried to be, they, they have been able to relate to the museum far easier. And, um, you know, people still ask us that, can we have this exhibition, uh, you know, to, uh, we, we would like to showcase in other cities. We said, yeah, sure, why not? Um, so we, we're looking at that op uh, options also. The other, uh, the, one of the last exhibitions, which is currently, um, you know, going on at the museum, is popular bazaar art of India. Again, a subject uh, where these artworks are no longer there. Nobody makes them with digitization. Uh, how gods of our country were used to advertise products, uh, not necessarily transport products, but this is beyond transport. This is how we involve our visitors when they come there, there, there is suddenly, they've come to a transport museum, but they're actually experiencing a, a completely different side of India, which, uh, which existed. Uh, and these artworks, whether they were 
printed at Ravi Varma uh, Press, or they were made by Durandar or local calendar artists. Uh, they all had a major role to play at those times. And it's a way of honoring them. It's a way of showing to the youngsters and to, to basically everyone that that this was an art that was prevalent there uh, during those times. And um, how, you know, how we have moved forward uh, uh, with, with newer digital technologies. Um, so as a museum, what we try to do and what we have been successful in doing is trying to captivate the audiences and explaining to them what things were from a different perspective altogether. I think that's, uh, that's in a nutshell I wanted to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thakralji. Yeah. Uh, we had a very good experience from what you have shown about your museum. Thank it's you. Centric museum with a simple storyline, yeah. and you have tried to amalgamate your technology with art and culture, and which is something for everybody. And the audio guides you have said, which adds up to the uh, visitors' experience and real life experience that you talked about the museum. Another interesting uh, exhibition you have talked about is the Bollywood and transport which has uh, repeat visitors again and again. Thank you, Mr. Thakral, once again, from BITM. Thank you. And, Thank uh, you very much. And, and now uh, we have completed uh, the presentation from the speakers. And we, I think we have some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, yes, can you just... You can ask from here. Uh, it was a very nice talk. You can sit down and ask. Microphone on for. Uh, hello. It was a very nice talk. And uh, I just curious about uh, what about this uh, inclusion of uh, Tesla kind of. It was a nice talk. Uh, uh, yeah, I was telling you. Uh, so I was just curious about uh, inclusion of Tesla or at least Indian versions of Asian version of Tesla in your museum. And uh, what was your uh, primary motivation about particular interest in the uh, transport? Yeah, this was two questions and I had another question for the previous speaker, which I asked. Uh, later. I think Maybe this question you are asking to Mr. Tarun Thakarji. Yeah, right. This one to yeah, Mr. Tarun. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, you, you are not audible, actually. You, you are on mute. Uh, please, sir. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I, I didn't inherit anything, if you were asking that. Okay, I was out of the country uh, pursuing my MBA in hospitality industry. I returned back to India, and suddenly I fell in love with these old things. Uh, so I started my collection in 1994. And um, when we decided to open the museum, uh, suddenly it became a sizable collection. And uh, the focus was transportation because I myself started loving. It started with cars, went on to all other modes of transportation. Uh, yes, Tesla will come. Or even a, a, yeah. a, a better battery powered uh, vehicle, uh, most probably the one which is made in India. We will try and get the first one. Uh, uh, we did have... Um, uh, you know, India had that Mahindra E2O or H2O. Uh, yeah, I think it was E2O, I think, uh, which was Reva earlier. There used to be a, a, a battery-operated car called Reva. Uh, we had it initially, uh, but we, we, we had some problems with it. So we had to give it away, and then we were looking for one. So both your, I mean, Tesla will definitely come because that's the future of automobiles uh, in terms of, you know, electric vehicles. And India's uh, way... Um, I mean, moving pretty fast 
on that um, scale. Anything else? <laughs> well, uh, Not thank from you. my side. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank, you. Ji. thank you. We have another question. Uh, can you just hand over the mic to her? Um. <coughs> Good evening, all. Uh, I have a question like, uh, what initiative and targets would increase mobility, training, career progression for all types of museum professionals? For all of you. you, want to... can you can, could you just repeat once again what you just asked? A little bit louder, uh, please. Like, uh, can I take this question? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure, sir. Please yeah. go ahead. Um, and it's a very interesting question. I mean, uh, if you really look at the awareness of museums in India, particularly in the last um, 10 years or so, uh, it's exceptional. Uh, it's uh, really like uh, I think technology mentioned that it's actually growing by growing exponentially. Uh, look at the, both the private sector and the public sector. I mean, until now, what was happening is particularly for the museology students, you were looking at the public, public uh, museums and uh, among the public museums, it's mostly government museums which are there in you know national museum and such others who have their own um, procedures. But now things have changed, um, changed very rapidly. Big big museums are coming up. Tukralji, I mean, yeah, Tukralji himself is having his own museum. There is an, um, one big museum coming up in Bangalore and all over the country. Um, so I think all of you who have taken up uh, museology as a course. Uh, in my opinion, we'll have a good uh, future. And there are very not many um, universities who are giving uh, museology courses. So I think uh, just wait for another five years, uh, three, four years, I think you'll have very good opportunities. Can I just say something here? Uh, yeah. Just to add on to what Sir just said, I think as, as students of muse museology, uh, we don't need to keep our blinders on. Uh, you know, today the world has changed. Uh, you know, we, we do uh, get great knowledge and experience from where we learn. But when you come to the real world, you know, the, your singular focus, whether you're a student of museology or a student of art, you need to be a visitor centric person. Uh, the moment you are a visitor focused uh, individual, you will succeed uh, because everything that 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 museums do today or will be doing uh their their, their focus uh, has to be on the visitor yeah yes any other questions you have uh, thank you sir but i i have another question like uh, can we relate history and culture with science in the science museums like uh, in the remote area can we uh, relate the science and art and culture uh, as uh, uh, Ambika Ma'am said, like ethnographic uh, items, she had uh, doing. Uh, she had did workshop. Uh, so in the uh, in our national science museums, can we uh, can we do also? Uh, look, I mean, both science and art, both are creative in nature. By by very definition, you know, the museums are these are all very creative areas. Um, unfortunately, there has been a compartmentalization of uh, science and art. In my opinion, um, you can definitely uh, uh, what is uh, what the art museums or the history museums have the collections of uh, utilitarian objects. You know, they are something to do with the science. So uh, there is uh, uh, even in the BITM museum where you are sitting, I mean, you will have a lot of these objects which are people can say if you go to the transport museum there, transport gallery. Uh, most of the things can be classified as art as well. There are some wonderful collections of uh, um, maybe the dioramas or the car of, uh, I think J.C. Bose is with you, um, or Meghnath Saha, I don't remember that. Uh, they, are, they are all a piece of uh, art as well. You know, in the earlier days when there was no the factory line, the, all the, most of the old cars, um, I think they are, each one of them are an art piece by, its, by themselves. I'm sure technology will agree that uh, beautiful uh, piece of art 
but then there is technology there is automobile there is thermal engineering i mean all these things it's it's a fusion of both art and science and uh, i think gradually when you move uh, move forward there is going to be a fusion or um, confluence of both art and science thank you sir uh yes i uh, but, uh, i think thakral ji wants to say something but you are again not audible sir no, I, oh, I, uh, I, I think uh, uh, you wanted to say, I think what I, what I basically wanted to just add on uh, was that as a transport museum, we, we have amalgamated art, uh, you know, in, in the transport museum. So I'm sure in science museums, you can do that. It's the same thing. Uh, it's how you present it, how, how you think about it. Uh, and again, look at it. If I'm thinking that this object or this artwork or this installation can come here, how would the visitor react to it? Uh, whether I'm telling some kind of a story which is related to my transport museum, or it's an object which is completely in contrast, and yet he will still get excited. So you have to look at it from both perspectives. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah Maybe I can add to that. <clears throat> Um, I think with the new um, new technology nowadays, um, a history mu historical museum or um, art museum, you know, can in include a lot of um, information about um, science and technology uh, because there are some <coughs> new information, you know, that has been discovered uh, by by science and technology. I went to the National Museum um, in one of the province and they just have a lot of, um, uh, 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 how do you call, um, excavation site uh, for the uh, people uh, who lived there for like, um, I think 3000 years ago. But with the new uh, technology, we can carbon dating and also we can extract some of the DNA um, in, of the remains, you know, and they find a lot of new information about uh, people there. So I think these information are um, very interesting and make uh, the, the story of uh, that um, site even more, um, more meaningful. <laughs> At the same time, um, um, in the Science Museum, I think there are a lot of element that people love and you can create it with the information about science we create um a, a, an exhibition a light exhibition you know which is very beautiful and we show that light from different um kind of elements different gas you know can um can uh, give different um uh, a spectrum of light and you can make like this kind of art exhibition based on science. So I think there are a lot of opportunities there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, Dr. Chando, you, uh, can, can you just shift the camera to doc, towards Dr. Chando and give the mic to him, please? Yes, uh, I would like to add, I think uh, Mr. Kenneth was a bit uh, uh, more modest. You know, uh, 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 science museums under National Council of Science Museums uh, have uh, several examples of such uh, amalgamation of science and social science and arts. In fact, the earlier transport gallery, just beside that, <clears throat> the room we are sitting, was an ideal, very, very exceptional uh, example of uh, uh, such, such synthesis. Uh, it started with the Indus Valley and uh, came, came to the modern Unfortunately, that has to be, you know, re renovated. The earlier uh, children's gallery in Birla Museum was another example of uh, am amalgamation of science and arts <coughs> that was based on uh, the Japanese's uh, development psychology. Uh, some of the exhibits are still uh, available in the DSC Purulia. Then National Science Center Delhi had the Information Revolution Gallery. That is a very, very uh, ex ex exemplary example of you know amalgamation of social science with uh, the science the heritage gallery uh, the, mr kenneth was the part of it and, and, and many such examples are there in fact uh, there uh, we have come into an era where no such compartmentalization can be you know exactly. afforded we, we cannot afford to compartmentalize arts and science in fact history is the uh, interpretive science 
So we have to that that era has come, and uh, so far my knowledge goes, Mr. Thakral's uh, museum uh, have have got a, a museology student in in their role. So there are uh, ample scope for the museology students, but the problem lies with the government, uh, the bureaucratic setup. They are very hard to you know crack the things. The RRs are quite archaic. That are the RR had, has to be you know devised, and uh, uh, Mr. Kennedy rightly pointed out there are many many private sectors are coming uh, coming up with their museums, and not bound by the strict bureaucratic setup, they are quite flexible. Okay. So uh, we will take a last question. I think that will be the last one. We are already overshooting the time. And uh, you, you can sit here and you can uh, you can answer you can co have your question. Please sit here. Hello. Yeah. So uh, uh, sorry, this is the uh, last question, and sorry for extending stretching it too much. Uh, I, this to last speaker, last to last speaker, Professor Chandra. So I was just curious about the in comparison to other uh, countries. So India is a multilingual country, and uh, so uh, like uh, the challenges will be, I guess, more difficult uh, for reaching to uh, everyone in the country. So in that perspective, uh, how like your uh, view, like uh, in comparison to other. Uh, country, uh, is, uh, how it is difficult and how it can be done uh, to reach uh, like uh, a multilingual country, like uh, which is, I guess, a very exception in the world. And one uh, comment I want to add uh, uh, to last discussion that uh, maybe the new edu education policy will be a solution we, to I think we are, we, uh, that. That will be the yeah. only question. We will talk about education policy in some other platform, okay? You know, uh, multi being a pluralistic society or multilinguality is not much of a problem because you need uh, several museums at several uh, places for different communities. Uh, just recently uh, come, uh, came up a museum, of no a novel museum in the Karbi Anglong, uh, you know, the, uh, the Autonomous Council. So that is a, 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 heritage, a heritage museum. That is a very good example of also the self-sustainability because they are uh, involving the local people also like the dakshina chitra museum at uh, chennai near mahabalipuram that is also another example of you know the way uh, the local communities are involved for sustainable development but the government museums are a, a bit you know in a, in a in a back seat that mindset has to be changed and uh, that I, okay i think uh, i could answer your question Okay, thank you all. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have come to the end of the session now. It has really been an, uh, been an entertaining and enlightened session for uh, all of us. We had speakers from a diverse field who have shared their views on the theme of this year's International Museum Day. This exchange of ideas, sharing of ideas, actually helps the museums to grow and diversify. I thank the esteemed panel of speakers uh, once again, and I thank all the audience who are present online and also in person at BITM. And we hope to meet meet again still, uh, soon with uh, with a similar program like this. Until then, it's goodbye from BITM. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you ma'am. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, my dear. Thank, thank you. you.